the first question is this, in your experience, what are the main factors really, or the criteria that influence a donor's decision to fund an MSME? Thank you very much, Lucky, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good morning to those of us in the far in the west, and good evening to those in the far east. Um, from the donor's perspective, um, over the course of the last ten to fifteen years, I've had cause to work with a range of donors from the USA AID, uh, the Global Fund. Um, to fight AIDS, uh, tuberculosis and malaria, UK aid, uh, EU, and now the USADF. And one thing that is very clear across all these donors is that um, most entities that approach them are you know, hardly structured, which is a very critical factor uh, that is necessary to access funding. Um, you know, most small MSMEs, because here we are going to be focusing on MSMEs, and not a lot of donors focus. Uh, fund MSMEs. And the reason is very simple. At that level, um, you know, most of the entities are unstructured and most of the donor funding available are really very big. And so most donors will want to fund at that level. And that's where the agencies like the USADF comes in. USADF focuses on very local uh, grassroots entities um, where we provide funding to help MSMEs and small scale uh, companies to access funding from these bigger donors uh, that otherwise would not fund them uh, because of their structure. And that's why USADF provides between $100,000 and $250,000 to help them build their capacity. And so even though we know as an agency that most of the grantees that we fund uh, do not have the requisite capacity and that we are going to invest in their capacity, um, one thing we always look out for is that you know, irrespective of the, uh, the low capacity, we want to fund entities that exist. If an entity does not exist, then, you know, there's nothing to build. So we want to fund entities that are existing entities. And the only way that can be proved is through, by, you know, through their legal situations. USADF and other donors will only fund entities that are registered under the relevant laws of the land. So if an entity is not registered, it's going to be difficult to, uh, to, to access funding. That is the first criteria. You know, beyond the registration, uh, most donors, and especially USADF, would want to know those behind the entity that is applying for funding. We want to be sure uh, that those, those individuals are people of the right standing um, in the eye of the law. And so uh, it's very important that all those forming an entity are people of, that are, have the right standing with the law. Uh, most donors, again, we want to see entities that have the, you know, the technical capacity uh, to undertake the venture that they, they, they are applying for. So if an entity is applying to become a, um, to intervene in the renewable energy space, we want to see evidence that, you know, there is a technical capacity to undertake that venture. If the technical capacity is lacking, which is what we see in most ventures, uh, then donors won't throw money there. Uh, you know, you can't set up an entity that does not have the technical capacity to handle a particular area, and then you think you'll be able to access funding. No, no donor will do that. USADF and other ent um, donors want to see entities that have the technical capacity to undertake the venture uh, that, they, that they, are, you know, they are proposing to undertake. Beyond the technical capacity, I uh, want to see evidence uh, that the entities have the capability you know, to undertake that project. And by that, we want to see evidence of past projects or undertakings that have been carried out by these same entities. Uh, if an entity is unable to demonstrate track record, then it's going to be almost impossible to fund those entities. There has to be um, evidence that the entity has done something like that in the past, uh, because we are talking about an investment um, in the range of $100,000 to $250,000, at the least for an agency like USADF. Most other donors want to throw uh, bigger sums into, this, into MSMEs. And so evidence of past track record is essential um, to, you know, to accessing funding. And you know, beyond the, all of these, um, entities should you know, begin to take their uh, you know, staffing very critical. Um, because it's very important for an entity to access funding, you need to have the right team in place that will be able to tell the story of that entity. 
Uh, because what we've seen over time is that entities are unable to tell their stories in a manner that attracts the donor. And to be able to tell this story, you need the right crop of people to write a proposal that will scale all the hurdles that the, the, the donor has put in place. Um, the, the, the team should be able to write a description of what the entity wants to achieve, their impact story, you know, their capability statement, you know, um, things like their financial management capacity, their legal situation, the internal controls that are in place, you know, and also a very good financial plan on how the funding will be utilized. Without all of this, it will be almost impossible uh, for any entity to access funding. And, you know, there will be no excuse for the lack, lack of capacity. The capacity has to be there. At, however busy that capacity is, it has to be on ground, first of all, before the donor scales. Uh, so these are some of the basic things that, you know, we look out for, you know, uh, before funding an entity. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. So we have had the basic things. And I, while you were talking, I, I was wondering um, if uh, for uh, Addis Agro has been funded, and it, then we have her has been funded by USCDF too. And I was wondering why she was listening to you, if she has the, the same thought that I'd had. And I wanted to ask her, what did she do? She, how did she identify and approach USADF? How were you able to know that there was funding available somewhere? And um, how did you approach uh, USADF or other funders that you have that you were able to get funding for your own MSMEs? We want to also hear from you where we'll come back to Andrew and then to other members of the panel. Thank you. Over to you, Daini. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. So uh, while they were talking, right, I was also jotting down. So, um, so I did a program, right, uh, with um, the U.S. Consulate, that's Academy for Women Entrepreneurs. That first time, I actually heard of um, uh, that there, there was a funding out for by U.S. ADF and. Um, first, I already started this business as in 2016. And I've been running it. I started it actually with just 30,000 euro loan from my brother. So, um, and the proceeds from the products that we sold, you know, I, I, we had to put it back in the business. But uh, I was going through trainings and looking at the vision that I actually had for the business. So I knew that I needed to take it to the next level, right? And prior to applying for the uh, grant, I had already learned also because I had two already failed businesses. And when I started this one, I didn't want it to fail. And one of the things that uh, why those business, two businesses failed were because I didn't have structure. I didn't have, um, I didn't have a business account. So it was my personal account. And as a woman, I know that this happens to almost, almost every woman. We tend to mix our business money with our um, personal, you know, um activities so i actually learned to uh, structure my business properly so now i learned that uh, i needed to get to the next level and all the things that i know that i needed to get to were put in place i knew the amount that i wanted i had all the documentation in place and there was the opportunity by usadf right I had to apply, though it was a rigorous application. <laughs> even at the time when the um, when I qualified, I, I didn't even know, I had already forgotten about it. But I know, I remembered that during the class with Awe, we were taught um, we were taught uh, how to prepare a cash flow statement that I never forget for my head. And I'm a graduate of foreign language and literature, French. So you see, I do not have anything to do with food or agri or math. I did not like math at all. But because I wanted this business to, to excel at this time, the third time, I needed to pay attention to uh, my finances, my accounting. It was, it was, I made it a duty to be able to learn how to do it. And, you know, they taught us how to use a cash flow statement even without um, hiring an accountant because I didn't have the money to hire someone else. So I had to judiciously learn how to do it. So I think I prepared my own cash flow. I don't know if that was why I wanted, but 
you know, I have the sense that because I was detailed enough to put down, do a bookkeeping of all the expenses that go out, all the inflows that came in, I was judicious enough to be able to impute it. So I went for uh, the grant. And even aside from that, I've won other grants, many grants, even one I got last week. So one thing that have made me to get to know funders, I know what I, I, I want personally. Because as a business, we should be able to understand at which stage are you in the business and which funding are you supposed to go for. And a lot of people make mistakes. Okay, you're just starting a business and you want to go for, for example, grant or loan or equity. I learned to start properly. I started from, some, I call it fools, right? They're my family. I started with my brother because I just pitched this thing. Oh, I have this. I want to start this business. He didn't even know. He just gave me the money. So for a startup, we need to start from our family, our friends, you know, then we can now graduate to, to different levels of funding. I right, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, and you also manage the time very well. So we just want to, uh, you were talking about as a point, you never knew what you did right. By the end of the day, you knew that you would set your documents in place. And then there was a rigorous documentation process. That's just where, honestly, that's honestly. where I am bringing in the team from DDI. Mm -hmm. This is what they do. They go out and ensure that these MSMEs are fit for funding. So I'm going to be asking the very first question, really. I know before, uh, there are some of the things that Mr. Andrew has mentioned that they would mention, but I want us to also delve into other areas that you look at for. So the first question goes straight to the specific factors, what are they that you consider when you are going on these due diligence uh, uh, processes when evaluating MSMEs for and preparing them for uh, donor funding? This question is going to Shio at today. Thank you, Lucky. And um, so when we look at a due diligence process, just like uh, Andrew and Adana has, uh, they have confirmed, it's actually a very gross process, okay? And depending on the funders, okay? But the, 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 the essence and the outcome is for us to, I mean, prepare the applicants, prepare them ready for the grants and make their proposals or applications bankable, okay? So Andrew has mentioned some of the criteria, you know, in terms of, the documentation, documentation and in terms of um, the, the the financial records of the company. Beyond that, also and more so on the documentation, we we also want to look at just like you said, technical capacity, organizational capacity, management capacity. Okay, and in doing that, we are looking at documentation. It's not just about documentation, and then you have all the documentation setting or you are not too, I mean, you have an issues with documentation, then you may actually have issues being considered for, um, uh, for grants. Then also, we, we also look at, uh, we want to make verification of your fiscal address. You know, you want to access funds. The funder wants to know that, wants to be assured that you have a fiscal presence, okay, beyond what you propose. Also want to look at um, your originality, the uniqueness and innovation of your proposals. What are your goals? Does it sync? Does it sync with the funder's goal? Okay. Is your application in line with scope or the area? Does it cause across the scope of operations of the funder you want to see? A, 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 a funder is asking for, I mean, there's a call for a proposal in a particular sector, and then you are approaching them with another, um, something outside the scope. So it will not fly. Those are the kind of things. Look at the output too. These uh, funds you want to access, what do you set to achieve with it? What is the budget behind it? What are the assumptions? What are the estimates that you have made considering the funding that you want to add, um, uh, um, secure? And what are the assumptions behind it? At times you submit your financial model. We want to look through it. How realistic? The inputs, you know, the projections, you know, your cash flow, your audited financial system, just like you said want to look at your history, financial history as well, and be able to be sure, the donor wants to be sure that the money that they're giving out 
I mean, it's not just business as usual. They want to follow their money and they want to be sure that the funds are going to be at, um, with capable hands and that they're going to deliver the project. So we also have uh, verification exercises that tend to highlight some of the, uh, address some of the fears that a potential um, funder could have. And we can also do um, the physical inspection or exercises. It could be referral checks. You know, we ask for your referees, want to know your um, performance in the past and how it can, I mean, um, how it, it will come to bear on this present funding. So that and many more, you know, those are things that um, a funder and a reviewer look at when uh, reviewing the application at the application phase. Thank you, uh, Chaya. Thank you for also making use, a good use of the time allotted for that section. I will come back to um, Andrew as regards uh, uh, examples of successful MSME. But before we go, I just quickly want to add, ask that Tosin to share. Um, um, Chaya has mentioned some of the criteria that you look, you look at for when you're going on this due diligence business. I want you to actually tell us uh, the methods that you employ when going for this due diligence business. What I do is how do you finally sift through the applications that you have? What are those checklists that you have that ensure that some are selected and some are not recommended for funding? Just say. Okay, so thank you so much uh, to the panelists and thank you the moderator for, for this session. Uh, in terms of verification, there are, there are, several, there are several ways that, that we go about that. We know that anybody can make any claim, but it is during the due diligence that we tend to break everything down and find out what the truth is. And the first thing we do is in terms of documentation review. Uh, so we send out a, a list of documents that we require based on the donor's needs, and then we request that they send it to us. So sometimes the, the, the organizations, the actors do not send exactly what we need. It is during that, that documentation stage that, that we get to see that. Also, on our own hand, we also do online, online re research. We, we, you said you are in a particular location, and then we go to your website, and we can't even see that location there. That is where we see that. Sometimes, to not just knock you off completely, we have interviews, uh, virtual interviews with you, and to ask you these, these questions, and to clarify some of the things that, that we've actually seen in the documentation. But one of the most important things that we do is in terms of site visits. We physically visit your location and find out that you, you mentioned that you are a producer of something. We get to check what are the things that you're actually producing, how are you producing them, and to what extent are you even producing them. If you want a if you want funding for, for 20, 20 million and you and you've told us that you've done something that is as much as 30 million, we want to be able to see that that is actually actually correct. And for most funders, they always want you to provide references. And that is where the references checks come in. With there are situations where people get to even find references. And there are even times when when you check the references, we realize that the references are, are not available to vouch for you. And those are some of the things that we, we also consider in, in checking those things. For some donors, there are, there are some third party verification that they do. So uh, they have that uh, you submit your some, some documents and they cross check them. Sometimes after cross checking them, they realize that this, these documentations are not true. So these are some of the things that, that they check. And it's important that organizations have their house in order. If you want to use a person's reference, make sure that you actually let the person know that tests can be done so that the person is not caught nothing when that vacation process uh, takes place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tosin. Uh, quickly, I, I, I know while, while you were all talking, I was looking at Andrew and he was nodding, and I know in it, I want him to share with us an experience in terms of uh, an example of a successful MSME uh, that aligns with the USADS funding objectives and explain why such an MSME stood out from the rest and why that, that MSME was selected for funding. 
Um, before you, before you uh, begin, Mr. Andrew, I really want to say that we are seeing the questions on the chat box and we're, at the end of the, this seminar, we are going to uh, be giving a few people the mic to ask some of those questions while we read some others out. Some are directed to specific persons on the panel. We will ensure that we take a look at all of that. Thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, um, Lucky. So w when it comes to um, talking about entities that we funded and, you know, turned out to be very successful, I am spoiled for choices because we have, you know, a number of them, you know, too many to be counted. Uh, because the USADF screening process always leads to selection of entities that produces, you know, you know the best results. Um, and so if I'm asked to talk about one, um, I would, you know, talk about um, Haven Hill Synergy, uh, one company that is very um, close to my heart. Uh, and that's because uh, when I joined the USADF in 2017, uh, that entity was one of the first I reviewed their application. And, you know, something that stood out for me uh, for that, uh, in that entity is that the fact that, you know, the founder is a really very passionate person about off-grid energy you know, uh, solutions. He is somebody that is passionate about providing uh, small-scale renewable energy solutions to uh, rural communities across Nigeria. And you know, uh, at the point that you know, he submitted his application, um, he, he had already gone through a yearly program, which is the Young um, African Leadership Initiative Program. And so USAID have decided to invest, haven't read his application and found all the criteria you know, met by the entity, USAID have funded that entity. And, you know, as expected, the performance was, uh, you know, outstanding. Uh, the entity was able to deploy a, a mini grid somewhere around Kigbe community in the FCT, around Kwali uh, area council in Abuja. And because of the result from that, um, that undertaking, USAID even scaled up uh, to another um, village in the same quality called Yebu. As we speak today, Haven Hill Synergy that used to be an MSME in, in 2017 when I joined the USADF is now a big company, um, you know, and one of the lead players in the renew renew renewable energy space in Nigeria. Uh, if you go online to check for Haven Hill Synergy, you would agree with me that they are no longer small as, you know, we met them a few years ago, which is the mission of USADF, to find and fund entities that have the potential for scalability and impact. Um, we believe strongly that, you know, USADF funding in 2017 uh, provided the needed catalyst that, you know, that, was, that the entity required to scale to the level it is currently. And, uh, you know, we are really impressed at, you know, the performance of ABUHI and many other um, MSMEs that we funded in the past and, you know, MSMEs that we, we will fund. But before you come through that eye of needle, uh, that USADF provide, you need to meet, check all the boxes, just like Abu Hill did. They provided the, the, the requisite knowledge, the technical capacity, the financial model that we wanted to see that showed that they have, you know, that, uh, you know, impact, that, you know, potential to scale, and which is what we want to see, the potential to reach, you know, hundreds of people running into thousands, if possible. Uh, we start seeing all of those fund those entities, and Abu Hill, yeah. Checked all the boxes and have you know lived up to expectations. Yeah. So so thank you. While you were talking, it just leads me straight to um, and I'm sure many others have the same question in mind. We're mentioning scalability and um, impact, and I want to know. This is a follow up question to you, Andrew. How do you um uh, evaluate an MSME's potential for scalability and impact? Because others will be saying, yeah, you saw that it was scalable, and then potential for impact then you said they are funded and they want to know how do they position themselves to also be along that line for funding. Okay, thanks for doing lucky. Uh, so uh, when we talk about scalability, we, put, we are essentially looking at the possibility of the enterprise or the MSME to grow from the short, medium to the long term. And, you know, there are a number of indicators that we look out for that, you know, tells us that this uh, entity has a potential to scale its operation and you know reach you know thousands of people. The first thing we look out for is the idea. Um, most entities that end up being scalable are entities that have innovative ideas. And so one of the criteria that we look out for in a proposal 
is the innovation that they are proposing, the innovative idea they are bringing. Without innovative ideas, no entity can, can move from the, where they are to, to scale. So the idea is very critical. When we look at the, the innovation in the idea that is being proposed, we are able to judge if this enterprise you know, has you know, that potential for scalability. We also want to check if the enterprise has the potential to attract additional funding after, you know, their, after the cycle of funding. Because one of you know, the, the criteria that we, we, we look out for is your ability to attract follow-on funding. If we fund you at $100,000 or $250,000, you do not show any potential to attract follow-on funding, then we, we, we know, uh, you know, from inception that you do not have that potential for scalability. So we always want to check if you have, you know, one or two funders in mind beyond, um, you know, the funding that you are looking for. Uh, you need to tell us how the $100,000 or $250,000 you get from us will help you reach that funder that you are targeting. It may be a commercial bank, it may be a development finance institution, or even another donor that will fund you at a much higher scale. You know, we want to see that in your, you know, in your application. We want to see the level of network that you, you demonstrate. We want to see how many donors that you've worked with in the past. You know, all of these are indicators, um, you know, to show that you are scalable, you know, in the short, long and medium term. And on a general scale, most entities from experience that scale are entities that have the right culture, they have the right people with the right character, and they, are, they have this listening attitude. They can listen learn, take corrections, and make the necessary adjustment that will take them to where uh, they, they want to be. So some yeah. of these are some of the indicators we look out for when judging scalability of an entity. Yeah, thank you. That's like a long list. And, uh, and while you were talking, some of us, I'm very sure some, some people were saying, but I am just an early stage MSME. What do, how do I stand a chance in all of this? But while I was thinking about that, I saw Adani and she was smiling. So I want to ask her. Can you mute, please? Because you don't take Please, let's mute our devices so we can hear what we're saying. Thank you. So I saw her, she was smiling, and I wanted to ask her um, two questions actually mentioned one right now. Um, having secured this funding from the USADF, I, I want to know because she was not uh, a big MSME as of the time she, she started looking for funding. So for other MSMEs, you stand a chance. You don't have to have everything. You have to have some of those things. So how did you do it? And um, um, what were the specific challenges that you faced during the funding process? And how did you overcome it? That's the challenge. And then an advice for other MSMEs who are seeking funding in terms of attracting, attractively positioning themselves to do not. So two questions. People are asking themselves, do I stand a chance? So we want to ask you, how did you do it? What were the challenges that you faced? And what are the advice that you have for MSMEs that are coming up? And mm -hmm. look, if we can just do this in three minutes, we'll be very happy. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So uh, I was just, uh, you know, smiling because everything that, you know, he has said were true. I, you don't necessarily need to be very big businesses, right? And I remember he mentioned scalability, right? How scalable and how, what are the potentials that you have? So every big businesses that we see today did not start as big businesses. They started actually small. So when I, when I got the funding, I was in my kitchen. I was still in my kitchen, right? Before I got the funding. And it was only me and some part-time um, staff that I had. So it wasn't like it was a big deal, even though that the money that came was huge. And it propelled me because immediately the funding came, I was able to move from that my kitchen into our mini factory now. We had issues uh, with um, buying uh, raw materials in bulk. So what we were doing before is the little money that I had, I would buy then um, when I sell, I will recoup it or use it and buy it. That's not how, it shouldn't be like that. That was even what propelled me when the money came, you know, we were able to buy and store, right? And that was in the wake of COVID. And you, a lot of us will know that COVID crippled a lot of businesses, but funny, our business thrived, right? Because 
when the money came, we were able to get a lot more supermarkets. People could go to supermarkets and buy things. So we got our NAVDAC uh, certification. Um, it, that was when we built our website. Um, a lot of things happen. So um, for my business plan, what I think that stood out for us, that why we got the funding was the viability of the business, right? There's a problem generally about food safety globally. There's a problem with uh, post-harvest losses, you know, that is costing Nigeria millions of dollars. And those were the things that we are solving. So for any funder, they want to know that if they give you money, you're going to use it to solve a problem, a menace in your community or in, in your nation. They want to also know that you're going to employ. Because when we got this money, we were able to employ. It wasn't only me anymore. I was able to employ more people. Um, a lot of changes happened. Also, one of the, one of the big changes that we, we had, especially in that COVID, I had issues with a transportation logistics. So with the funding, we're able to procure this car that I am in that makes it easy for us to transport the goods that we get from customers or raw materials down to our factory. Um, then another thing, like I mentioned earlier when I was talking about was your final bookkeeping. We can't stress that enough. Even if you're going to use money for something, please ensure you write it down. I don't think, I don't think really, even though that they want to check your books and everything, they want to make sure that the money that goes out is equivalent to the money that comes in. And I remember Mrs. Shire, she gave me like, I was praying anytime that she's, she's sending me a message. I was, I was telling my mom, ah, this woman, no, she was so detailed that every cobble that was given to me was used judiciously and there's an evidence so when they say grants like this grant is not for you to go and use it and go and you know uh buy your shoes buy your whatever it is for you to use it for what they are, you said you're going to use it and evidence from that small money uh, 18 customers that i have we boast now of over 365 in our database and millions of indirect customers that shop from uh, or from different supermarkets right, so right yeah. right yeah thank you thank you wonderful success stories there and so you mentioned how the di team was detailed in the due diligence activities and that brings me to the to the question um mm -hmm. this this question will go straight to to shayo and because he mentioned you and i want to know where are there specific uh, challenges or common red flags that you encounter during these due diligence processes, then uh, uh, increase your chances of being recommended, of recommending this SMS or not recommending them. Are there red flags? Are there challenges that you go through? On the, so that MSMEs that are represented here listening will know what to avoid so that they will also be funded. Okay, thank you, Lucky, and uh, Adani, good to hear from you again. All right, okay, so during the due diligence process, of course, for a detailed reviewer, you actually spot some red flags, okay? And uh, it now depends on the gravity or the materiality of that, uh, that spot. So for, for an average uh, due diligence exercise or review, there are, of course, red flags. When you see red flags of competence, when the uh, application does not align with reality, okay? The books, we have, we have a system, you have a weak internal control system, okay? Your financial management system is weak or poor, right? Or your um, governance structure is weak or poor. The, uh, um, a reviewer will start having second thought about your application. Your books, what are your books saying? If your books are not adding up, we don't even have anything to form an opinion or review, you know, in retrospect about your company. Then we have that red flag. Can this company, can this applicant actually manage this funding? Another thing is your compliance level. You, 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 uh, you, means, Many 
a lot of small businesses do not have policies. That is written policies. And the ones that have barely actually comply with it. And then such policies are actually supposed to be like, in a way, strengthening your controls, internal controls within your organization, such that it gives uh, a reviewer that level of comfort that, okay, fine, these people have a system, durable system, albeit basic, okay? You have controls, uh, authorization controls, you have fund management, you have good accounting records, you know? That is very key in the area of compliance. Compliance with also local, local um, regulatory authorities, okay? You're not, I mean, you don't pay your tax, you don't comply with any of those laws. You don't care as a small or micro business owner. Those are little, little things that competency, very, very key. You don't have this skill in this particular area. And you have not even made any effort to probably fill that gap, okay? Or uh, collaborate with somebody that has it, okay? And strengthen your application. Those kind of things, they are red flags. You cannot say you're working in, uh, in, in this field and there is a, uh, a call for another field and you're applying and you have not even tied it up your own in-house to make sure that you can speak to that problem. That's the funder mm -hmm. wants to address. So, All right. so many red flags, so many red flags. Uh, but all right. I, I, I don't want it to look like it is all glooming for those who don't have all of that. So that's why I want to ask this question and I want you to go to Tosin and I want to, Tosin to make a case for early stage MSMEs and something that shows that there is, a, that there is hope uh, for those who don't have those uh, criteria that you mentioned. So I have two questions, Tony. I just want to mention them. So because of time, I, the first one will have to be, um, everybody is talking about how you have to have your books, you have to have financial stability and all that. So I want to ask this question. How do you assess the financial stability, viability, or otherwise of an MSMEs? And I'm speaking for both early stage MSMEs and those who are already in existence. How do you assess that? And the other question will have to be, what advice would you give to any MSMEs to better prepare themselves for uh, recommendation for funding, really? Because as they say, um, uh, donors and, uh, are like pizza toppings. You have to find the right combination that makes your SMS irresistible and leaves them craving for more. So how do you do that? What advice will you give them to ensure that they are irresistible to donors? So the first one, how do you determine the financial stability and viability of was of both early stage and existing MSMEs and then the advice for, for them? Just in quickly in three minutes so that we can begin to okay, wrap so up. Thank, 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 thank you, Lucky. Uh, many SMEs do not take as much importance to their financial proposals as it is to their technical. And that's probably because they are very good in what they do and they just feel that because they are good, the donors should automatically trust them with the finances. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. And so the first thing that should really happen is the preparation of financial statements. So when you provide the financial statements to donors, they can see a lot of things in your, in, in your documentation. Um, they can see your profitability. They can look at your cash flow. And that's why it's also important that when you are working uh, on your projects, when you are working on your business, you should always bring on uh, people that are in the space. You have accountants, have lawyers that, that can help you to look at these things. And of course, another thing that determines financial viability is in terms of your debt level. So we have certain organizations that are taking on a lot of debt. And that is something that causes donors to pause and say, look, if we if you have a lot of debt and you're asking us to give you funds, uh, are you not going to use the funding that we give you to settle that debt? In fact, some of the donors have gone on to even ask those that have provided you the money to provide the guarantee that you will not use the funds to repay them. And that's just to show that they really do not want you to, to, to have a lot of debt. So that aspect of being able to manage your fund is very important. Uh, while we were talking earlier, we had talked about having audited accounts, which is very important. Uh, if you if you if if you don't have a debt account, you can have something called the manual account. So you don't need to to wait to for that before you start putting all these things into place. And the aspect of being tax compliant is very important. So um, you might be asking, how does that have to do with the financial viability? It has to do because if regulatory authorities realize that you don't pay tax, they can give you uh, they can hit you with penalties. 
And if, the, if it's a hefty storm, uh, donors can, can become fearful that you use the fund that you use on the project to, to settle the penalties uh, with the tax authority. So those are some of the things that can also actually help. In terms of the advice I have, um, a, a good way to start is to say that in terms of the, even your finances, have them in place before, from now on. Always make sure that your finances are in place. Just be, just be prepared for due diligence because it will come. Uh, it's also important for you to always have documentations in place. Uh, some organizations will need to hire bookkeepers that will, all they will need to do is to just put, put their house in order, uh, record whatever transactions they have, their suppliers that they have, they can have. Because all of these things will actually come in handy when it's time to, 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 to approach donors. And you will be surprised that there are so many businesses today that do not have a clear business plan. They, they just run the business the way, the way they think business should, should be run. And they don't really have like a clear business plan. You ask them about, about their, their market potential, they don't have it. You ask them about the commercial advantage that they have in the market, they don't have, have it. Many of them do not even have simple things like internal control systems, where you have just one person in the organization is the one that can, that can approve um, payments. So then what happens if uh, you are not reachable. What happens if you are incapacitated? Does that mean that there will be no no ins and outs in terms of finances in your organization? So just be prepared. Have the mindset of the donor. Say, if you are to give your funds to somebody else, how will you want? What will you require from the person? What are the questions that you have from the person? So putting yourself in the shoes of the donor is, is always important uh, in terms of uh, getting yourself ready. Or when they do not eventually come. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Justin. Uh, uh, we we are we're rounding off now. We'll be moving to the um, the question and answer section. Someone was saying on on the chat board saying that we cannot actually uh, we cannot finish this topic in one uh, webinar. That might have to be another one. There are several things that we're going to put in place for such a thing. Yeah, I agree with that person. But we'll do what we can do, and then. Uh, look forward to another webinar. But now that we have time and we still have Andrew here and we still have Adani here, just for just concluding thoughts while we move on to the question and answer section. Uh, but before that, I want to also say to everyone on this call, uh, somebody asked a question, how were you, how did you know there was a funding from USADF and all of that? Some of, more, these days we always put, even before now, what we always do is that a funding opportunity, we put them on our platforms on social media and those who have also um, as subscribe to our um, uh, email newsletter uh, channel. We also send opportunities emails to everyone. So if there is an opportunity, if you don't see it, you won't know there is opportunity somewhere. So what you should do is follow us on social media. It's at DDI Nigeria, DDI Nigeria. And when the opportunity, we'll put it there. We will always send an email to everyone who has registered. And for those who registered for this platform, while we are sending this recorded video to everyone. We also ensure that we send other opportunities and resources to everyone. So this is me asking you to uh, give us the permission to add you to our mailing list so that we will be sending you opportunities and you know when they exist. We want to ask Andrew, I want to first of all, what are those uh, emerging trends or areas of focus that donors are now increasingly uh, interested in when considering uh, MSMEs? And apart from the financial support for grant. What are those other support that donors can also give to MSME? And this is the, these are just concluding thoughts from Andrew. And if we can just wrap this up in two minutes, we will be fine before we move on to the question and answer section. Andrew, in two minutes, please. Okay, so um, the other areas that donors uh, actually provide support um, uh, you know, include you know building the technical capacity of entity because we've realized that over time, uh, most entities are unable to access funding uh, only because you know they don't have the capacity uh, to access this you know funding that are available. So you see, um, many entities look out for funding, but they are unable to get it because they don't even know how to apply. They don't know um, you know what to look out for. They don't know, you know, what is required of them. Uh, some of them even wait till the last minute before they apply due to lack of capacity 
so donors actually like USADF actually provides other capacity building support beyond finance. Uh, because we know that if you provide just finance, um, you know, there's a potential that if the, you know, the grantee doesn't have other capacity like organizational development capacity, you know, ability to write business plans and all, they will not be able to manage the funding very well and also to be able to yeah. scale to any other level. Yeah. yeah, so I was also asking about the um, emerging trends in yeah. terms of where, what, what are those areas that donors are now focusing on? So that some people would think maybe they're they are just on the wild goose chase. Are there also specific areas? Yeah, if you check the world today, yeah, you'd realize that most donors are now moving away from the free funds to more business-focused entities. And that is where yeah. MSME come. Most donors want to throw their monies into areas that will solve problems, that are social problems, and also provide jobs to people. And, and, and so agriculture uh, forms one of the you know, biggest opportunities available to, to, to MSMEs in Nigeria today. Most donors want to throw their money into agriculture. Uh, by throwing money into agriculture, you solve uh, the food um, insecurity that we currently face. At the same time, you provide jobs to people and livelihoods as well uh, to the teeming population uh, you know, across Africa and the country at, uh, at large. So uh, most donors want to fund innovative solutions that provide more than one pronged solution to a problem. And so if you are in the ag space, if you are in the tech space, if you are in the um, renewable energy space, then you are in the right space. You need to you know, drill down and get your act right uh, because there are lots of funding opportunities available you know, in that space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is we, are, we We don't have uh, much time for this, but we will quickly make use of the remaining uh, 20 to 30 minutes that we have left. And this is where we move to uh, the question and answer section. But before you, um, if you can see on your screen, there is a webinar poll ongoing. Please kindly take a look. This is a feedback. This is what prepares us for another one and what tells us that this is what we have done is, is also uh, in the right direction. Please take, it, take your time and feel that this poll and submit while we are moving ahead with the other part of this webinar. This is where we do questions and answers. I'm very sure my colleague Philip has taken some time out to copy some questions from the chat box, why the names of those uh, participants would call or some of them to ask their questions. Philip, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Loki. And thank you all the panelists also. They have taken some questions with me and um, I'll quickly read out some of the questions here. We have Mr. Adirani Adewole that says, what happens when a newly established organization or entity applies for funds? And um, I don't know if I should take a series of the questions so that they can, the panelists can react to it because of our time. Yeah, I think I just go and read about three. Um, yes. Another person, Peter Elias says, this question is for Mr. Ichono. Why is it that USCDF don't seem to send replies to those who apply for funding? Then the third question says, what critical sectors are benefits from these donors? Please, our panelists, kindly react to this. Okay, so one of the questions was directed at me, and that is, um, why um, USADF does not respond to those that applied? Well, I don't think that's entirely true. We always respond to those that are successful. As you can imagine, an entity like, um, an agency like ADF will get interest from different parts of the country and even in the world. When we throw up an application in, say, a kitty state, you'll be shocked that we get applications from Somalia, Ethiopia, even though the program is, from, is for a kitty state uh, or for Lagos State, we get you know, applications from Namibia and Zambia and across the country, even though uh, the requirement states that, you know, the, uh, the opportunity is only open to entities resident in that particular state. Now, what that tells us that we are getting a large volume of application uh, and, you know, that we are unable to respond to one after the other. So the uh, strategy adopted by ADF is to respond 
to successful applicants. And so if you apply for funding and you, you did not get any um, response from us, it means that you know, your application was not successful. And that is usually stated in the RFA uh, that applications, will own, uh, response will only go back to those that are considered successful. Now, after we review our first stage and second stage, we always come up with a short list. And you know, if, for example, we have 20 entities and 10 of them cross, the other 10 that did not cross, we always write to them to explain why we are unable to proceed with them. So while we are unable to respond to the myriad of other applications, we always respond to the few you know, that we select to go through the screening process. All right, thank uh, so you. That is, yeah. Thank you. I... The other two questions. Okay, there's this question about newly established uh, entities applying for funding. Well, um, so um, at ADF, we have different level of funding. Um, we have the, the $5,000 to $10,000 you know, funding for young Africa leadership initiative, um, individual for young people that want to apply to test their concept. USADF is willing to fund those kinds of entities with up to $10,000 to test and try their concept out. So if they are a new entity and they have an innovative idea, um, USADF will be willing to help them test that idea uh, up to the tune of $10,000. So even if they have you know, not a lot of track record, they can access up to ten thousand dollars to you know test their concept, but at the level of a hundred thousand dollars, you'd agree with me that that's significant funding, and that ADF would require um, you know some level of track record for you to access that level of funding. Uh, and so, if you are a new entity, there is a funding opportunity available, but it's at a much lower level uh, to enable you test your innovative ideas. Uh, so, but as a new entity, you may not be able to apply for bigger funding because we need track record to be able to award those uh, funds. Philip, do you have more questions? Okay, sure, um, done. Because of our time, we'll just take two more questions. One yes. from the chat box. Can one says, take one from the audience? Yes, we'll take one more for the, we can take two from the audience. All right. Well, let me quickly take this question here. It says, how does new MSMEs access both financial and technical support from the donors? Yawuza Abdu. Okay, can, how I, does can, I, can I answer that? Yes, yes, just go ahead. Oh, okay, so I'll start from the last, right? Technical, the um, then funding. I think all, everything that we've been saying, I've been talking about how to assess um, funding, right? But for the technical support, I'll give an example. I remember um, when the funds came and during execution and a lot of businesses to bear witness to um, the issue of staffing. And I know Tosin is the one that had, you know, uh, that part of uh, DDI staffing um, department. I, I reached out to Mrs. Shayo and she said, oh, okay, um, one of my colleagues is the one that handles there's a partnership with LSCTF. They um, give businesses, uh, staff, and all that. And I reached out and I got two. I got, they sent me two people. I actually had to take one. And that one, the one person that he has been working with me since, that since 2021 up till just um, last month that he uh, resigned due to uh, relocation. So, um, USADF or DDI, they don't just only give you um, funding and leave you, they monitor your progress. And I remember each time we speak, she will ask me, is there any problem? Are there areas that you, that you have uh, problems, you know, that you have issues that we could uh, help us? And, and they do that. Also, I remember um, even when the funding came, I remember there was a change in scope. I told her because the business has taken a new shape and I needed to... Um, I needed to start targeting another market. And I reached out to her. She said, okay, do it this way, do it this way. So um, what they do, they don't just give you funding and leave you. They give you funding and hold, hand hold you to make sure that what you say you achieve and you do more. So thank you. I hope I, I, I answered that. Thank you. Yes, you did. You did well. Philip, can we give a member of the audience, the participants? Yes. To ask a question. That was the next uh, question. Okay. okay. 
If you have questions for us from the audience, please raise your hand virtually. While we are doing that, I also want to remind us that uh, the questions is recurring. We have a recorded version of this webinar. The answer is yes. Are we going to share it after this webinar? The answer is yes. Will you have uh, resources, more, do you have more resources for us? The answer is yes. All you need to do is to uh, just ensure that your email is with us and then we, we will send it to you via email. Somebody is saying I have a question. That's the reason we have okay. this. Okay. I'll be able to follow more, please. Can you go ahead with your question? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, what's the timetable like for uh, the application? Uh, how does it go? Because I tried to check the uh, the website and I realized Nigeria is not one of the countries that are eligible. And uh, I also, I mean, check, tried to check the Yali network uh, that was mentioned earlier. The application uh, uh, link is also not going to. I just wanted to know what's the timetable like for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, with respect to that, um, so we do not have any specific um, schedule for releasing our applications. Uh, the only thing we always say is, um, you know, always check our website. Um, so even though Nigeria is not on that table, Nigeria will be there very soon. So just be on that website, check in very frequently, um, you know, and then you will see Nigeria come on very soon. That's my, that's an assurance that you know that you know you can get. Especially with uh, with respect to our agricultural programs, then um, for off-grid energy that comes out early in the year from experience. Nothing specific, but you know most of our off-grid energy projects come out very early every year. So for this year, one came out around January into February. That's closed now. And then for our LSTF project also early in the year, um, you know, at times late in the year. So there is no specific schedule. It, it's as we get funding, you know, all our funding um, opportunities come based on funding that we have. So if there are funding, uh, if there's fund available, then we, we throw out an RFA, um, you know, so just stay glued to our website and other social media platform and follow DDI as well. Yeah, I was going to say that we, we not just following is not just enough anymore these days because as soon as you get on social media, so many things are in your faces. But set up the notification so that once it drops on our platforms, you are also uh, notified. Um, I, I I don't think we don't have time anymore. So I wanted to also say, you know how social media works? There's something called algorithms, right? So whatever you search for. Anytime you open social media, it has a way of just popping on your face, right? So you want to get information about funding opportunities, uh, technical support. Those are the kind of things that you search and they just pop up. And also ensure that you follow communities because, you know, word of mouth has a long way to go with all these things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, valuable addition. So I, for the resources and support for MSMEs, um, we'll, you'll, you'll be seeing that on your screen in the next couple of seconds, but we also be sending it to your email after this timeout. Um, once again, we are okay. We are okay. Uh, there's another person here saying, I have a question. I think that might be the last person who might be able to take for today. Abir and David, please, can you ask a question? I'm building David, David, please unmute and ask a question. Okay, it appears I'm David is not close to the mic. So let's move on. Anything here? Let's move on. We, we don't have a building David close to the mic. And uh, um, I want to quickly um, ask my colleague David to project the resources and support channels on the screen. But we have said that 
because of timing, we're going to be sending it to your uh, email addresses. Um, uh, but before we go, I just want to hear, concluding, um, it, it's just in 10 seconds from every panelist we have here to speak to us as regards um, how we make our MSMEs um, attractive to donors. They said attracting donors is like dating. You have to dress up your MSME, put your best foot forward and convince them that you are the perfect match. So just in 10 seconds each, starting uh, with uh, Tosin, then we have Shayo, then we have Adani, and then we have Andrew in that order. Share us 10 minutes, your concluding thoughts, your um, parting words for this webinar. Tosin, over to you. So one thing I would say to MSMEs is that they should not have self-limiting beliefs. Many of them do not apply for, for grants because they think that the donors already have people who they want to choose. That is, that is not true. Uh, we've, we have several people who have, got, got, who have applied and they've gotten without knowing everybody. So put your best foot forward, apply and follow instructions, and soon enough, you, you, you have success stories to tell. Thank you, Taya. Okay, thank you. So my parting words will be that um, for those that might have actually applied to various, for various funding and were denied, don't lose hope. Keep the hope alive. Keep pushing. According to Churchy Whistle, he says that success is not final and uh, failure is not fatal. But it's what you decourage, what you do afterwards. Do you understand? Take the lesson, the learning curves, and move on. Continue to apply and try and try again. Thank you. Daniel, over to you, please. 10 seconds. It's not just for me. It's not just about dressing. I know you have to dress your application, but you also need to believe in whatever you want to put out. So what are you doing? Is what do you, what do you want to put forward? Does it solve any significant problem in the country? Look at what is happening now. You know that every donor, everything that is coming out now is dead towards the United Nations SDG goals. If your yeah. business does not tell lot to that, please go back and revisit it. Ensure that you are solving a problem. Thank so you. it's not that are just over there, right? Please Thank ensure you. that you're solving a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew, your 10 seconds, please. Okay, so. My final word would be MSMEs should stop behaving like MSMEs. They should start behaving like large entities. Uh, that way, they'll be able to take themselves from that basic level to you know, somewhere very attractive. Thank you, everyone. So this, we come to the end of this webinar. I'd like to leave you with a compelling call to action. Number one, assess your XME, MSME. Take a closer look at what you already have right now. As Andrew just said, start thinking global. So you start acting global too. Re refine your pitch, you have to craft a compelling narrative, and then expand your network, seek strategic partnerships, implement best practices, and be persistent and resilient. If at first you don't succeed, dust yourself up and try again, and then leverage available resources. You don't say, I don't have everything. I don't start it from her kitchen. Start with what you have, present what you have, and then from there, you can move on to... Mm -hmm a higher level. So now is the time to take action on and position your MSMEs for funding success. The opportunities are out there. You, you, they are all out there on a daily basis. Embrace the lessons that we have shared today, leverage your strengths, and embark on this exciting, exciting path towards growth and sustainability. Remember, the journey may have challenges as with all other journeys in life, but with determination, and uh, strategic efforts, you can overcome them and achieve remarkable outcomes. I encourage you all to embrace this call to action and make a lasting impact with yeah, your please. MSMEs. Please. Please. So Hello, good evening, we, Mr. Phillips. Thank we you. Have, sorry, thank you. We have come to the end of this yes, webinar. It is 4.30 exactly by our time. We told you we're going to keep to time and we thank you all for, for coming. And we thank you for attending this, as we have said. We are going to be sending you resources and then we are going to be sending you opportunities for other webinars. Thank you once again. Have a great time. I'll see you at the top.
Bye-bye.